Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. From being a relatively poor nation, to everyone's surprise, China has emerged as the world's second largest economy in the past decade or so. China's impact on the global economy and its political influence is not to be overlooked. Analysts argue that China will soon surpass America to become the world's largest economy in the next few decades. What surprises most people, though, is the fact that China has managed this rapid economic growth despite the fact that it is a single-party state ruled by a communist party that's been in power for more than half a century. How does a politically repressive state produce such an enormous middle class of consumers that have now become the engines of the Chinese economy? Helping us to make sense of this issue today is Salim Fakir. Salim is the head of the Living Planet Unit at the World Wildlife Fund, and he also has a regular column here at Saxis. Salim is a member of the China for Africa shift group, which is monitoring China's resource demands, investment and trade flows in Africa. He's in Cape Town and we're talking to him via broadband. Salim, you mentioned to me that you saw lots of conspicuous consumption in China when you were there. Lots of luxury brands of cars being driven on the streets of Beijing, for example. Tell us, what are your impressions of life in China, at least in terms of what you saw when you visited Beijing? What I found was uh, very fascinating is that uh, clearly over the last 30 years, China has invested heavily uh, in modernizing and industrializing its economy. And Beijing is a a clear display of that uh, phenomenon of growth and development that China has made since it opened up its economy uh, to the market and, and foreign investment and so on. Deep within the bosom of the economy is, is, a, is clearly an economy that's uh, based on a form of state capitalism. Economic uh, energy of, of the economy has been unleashed over the last 30 years. And you see the material uh, progress that uh, ordinary Chinese uh, have made as a, as a result of the growth. Just statistically, if I give you some figures, uh, 20 years ago, the Chinese per capita uh, income was around $800. Uh, that has now grown to about $6,000 uh, per capita. That's a significant uh, shift in the, um, income ordinary Chinese uh, have received. Because remember, China's removed... 400 million people out of poverty uh, over the last uh, decade or more with sustained growth rates of uh, 10% uh, on average. Uh, and has brought uh, this increase in income has also drive uh, you know, consumption. What is more important is to understand how China's wealth has also led to uh, material consumption, and uh, that's quite visible in the street in Beijing. All, all the major brands that you can, you and I can think of uh, or dream of, like Gucci and uh, other types of brands, uh, they openly in your face, um, and uh, you do see this also in the in the night uh, mall culture, for instance, where Chinese stay up late shopping visiting malls, and in Beijing, there's one mall follows another mall. Uh, and I think that was uh, a little bit surprising to me, to be, to be frank. How does a politically repressive state operating within a communist system produce such a vibrant class of economically active people? It's quite a curious blend between communist and the free market system. What are your views on it? The relationship between communism and what we see in the economy are two distinct uh, polar opposites of each other. I think mean, in, in the minds of many people, communism means uh, a form of uh, socialism, uh, uh, Marxist-dominated uh, state and so on, where the state uh, is the dominant uh, uh, you know, uh, controllers of the levers of the economy. That is largely true. The state still controls uh, uh, you know, large, uh, large segments of the land in, in China are still owned by the state. Uh, there are over 200 uh, major uh, state or ent enterprises which have many subsidiaries and that can run into thousands. And uh, the, the, there's opening up of, of the sort of the market economy since the 80s when Deng Xiaoping came in. Um, 
And so I think what you, what I think uh, has happened in China uh, since Deng Xiaoping, uh, particularly, is that uh, the Chinese are more concerned. The, the Chinese Communist Party is not so much more concerned about uh, you know what what it means to be communist, but r- rather what it means to be in power. And I think that uh, it recognized that with the failure of the Cultural Revolution and uh, the Great Leap Forward, there were disastrous periods after to Mao for, for 50 years. There's been a refocus and reform uh, program in China uh, since uh, the 80s that has recognized that if you do not open up the economy and sort of unleash the potential uh, of ordinary Chinese, which really happened, uh, particularly in the rural economy with um, uh, sort of the uh, village enterprise system and the ability of, of uh, peasants to grow surplus and be able to sell that uh, in the market. Uh, and then also the Chinese state uh, intervening directly in the economy where it uh, took a structured approach to uh, industrialization uh, particularly with uh, heavy industries and so on, and then encouraging uh, more foreign direct investment by uh, allowing uh, rural labor to move into areas uh, along the East Coast, particularly in Shanghai and so on, uh, uh, where export zones were established, that it would allow the cheap labor to become a competitive advantage, uh, particularly if, uh, where China over time became the, sort of the manufacturing center of the world for cheap goods. So I think that this was, uh, and you have to understand this, that uh, you can't understand uh, this economic reform without understanding the the history that, that China came from. And that particular history uh, was the 30 years political reforms uh, did lead to disastrous policy. And I think there's an admission of that. Uh, and I think with the opening up, uh, and in a sense, uh, some liberalization of the Chinese economy with great state intervention, uh, they've allowed uh, rather economic liberalization to take precedence over political liberalization. What does the average Chinese citizen think of her country's economic success? Does it concern Chinese people that human rights are suppressed in China? The people that I did conversations with, I sense that there is a sense of pride in uh, the development and modernization of China, and that the China stature in the world is growing. And I think when economies progress, um, uh, there's a general, in my sense, is a general feeling that that prosperity is also bringing. Uh, uh, in, in the populace is giving a sense of new pride and, and I think that is also filtering through this demonstration of uh, very, very overt nationalism against uh, Japan in the current crisis that China has with Japan uh, over uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Senkuku Islands uh, and so on. So my sense is that uh, the Chinese uh, you know, view the current situation as positive. Uh, I think it's very difficult to discuss uh, human rights issues. I mean, it's been difficult for me to get a view on the rural Chinese because I never went to rural areas, but certainly with urban Chinese and the more educated Chinese, uh, there's an acceptance of the Communist Party, there's an acceptance of progress economically, and there's a new pride in the fact that China is becoming a new global power. I think this points to the success of uh, the Communist Party in China. And the reason is that because it's able to adapt uh, to changing conditions. And I think that adaption t- talks a lot about the nature of the Communist Party, even though uh, outsiders view it as authoritarian, undemocratic, and so on, that it's able to concern itself with the needs of the populace. And I think this is topmost in people's uh, Chinese uh, leadership mind or political leadership mind is internal stability on China. That drives the way China thinks about itself and the world. And also has removed many people, millions of people out of poverty, uh, has given uh, the Chinese Communist Party confidence and has also given citizens confidence uh, in uh, the rule of the Communist Party in a kind of uh, mutual symbol that has evolved uh, over this time. And I think that's going to be very hard to untether unless uh, economic progress uh, doesn't happen. 
Should we be concerned about China's expanding global footprint? What does it mean for Africa and what does it mean for us, particularly here in South Africa? So in, in certain countries, uh, China's uh, foreign investment is significant in terms of its impact. But if you look in the constellation of uh, countries, uh, there are 50 or more countries in Africa. China's involvement is probably, uh, you know, 20% of that, uh, or, or or even less. So, so I think that uh, one has to be very careful uh, in terms of the fear mongering that goes along. Uh, I think what what I worry more about, about is uh, overall foreign direct investment in Africa and how it's being managed by African governments themselves. Uh, and I think the relationship of African governments uh, to their populace is far more an important concern that we should have. And uh, I think that uh, obviously China's needs for resources are going to grow as its economy grows, except that now its economy is slowing down. Uh, this year, the figures are around 7.5%. So it's slowing down and obviously its resource demands uh, will also slow down. I just want to give you a figure. For instance, there's been much made about China's uh, extraction of timber. Uh, resources uh, from a few African states, I think Gabon or the Congo. But actually, uh, from our studies, we show that the most significant timber imports actually comes from Russia. Uh, most of it is also illegal. Uh, you also have to distinguish uh, Chinese state involvement uh, in Africa through uh, explicit state-directed uh, 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 investments through its uh, state enterprises and its uh, development banks versus private firms. Many of these private firms are small enterprises, family-run businesses, and so on. For instance, there are around 800 uh, corporations involved. Uh, in 80% of them actually have no link to, with the Chinese state. So one has to be very careful uh, how one interprets uh, Chinese involvement. Of course, there's a, also movement of Chinese uh, in terms of migration. Uh, there's an increasing number of Chinese coming into Africa, and uh, South Africa, for instance, has an estimated number of about half a million Chinese. It is estimated in, in Africa, uh, possibly we're looking at about a million Chinese uh, that are dispersed over the African continent. I think what, uh, you know, China's investment can also be a positive thing if it's well managed by African governments. Uh, it's like any other foreign direct investment. It's not unique uh, to China. Thank you very much for joining us, Salim. No, thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service. And to all our listeners and viewers, if you're looking for more social justice analysis, please do visit our website at www.saxis.org.za.